My name's Tate Way. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, thank you, Cynthia. I really appreciate that. She said some really kind things. I especially appreciate being called cute. Um, that stood out to me more so than the spiritual stuff. <laughs> no, really, I appreciate that. And uh, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be asked by Cynthia to speak and to do anything for Alcoholics Anonymous. I know we hear that over and over from the podium, but I, I, when I hear somebody say it, I don't feel like, oh, wow, there they go again saying that. I know what they mean, you know. Um, how could you not, you know, uh, if your life's been saved by this program in the way that mine has. Um, but it, And it's an honor to be at this group, you know. Um, I, I've been here only, I think, about three times or so, but um, I've known, um, you know, Tom for most of my sobriety. My sobriety date's October 17th of 1999, and, um, and I... You know, it's kind of interesting. Robert Fry is my sponsor, and um, some of you may know him. He's out of uh, Harnett County, um, but we met uh, up in Boone, um, and he's been my sponsor for I think like 13 years now or something. But um, but anyway, his sponsor Steve, and Steve's sponsor is is Tom, and, um, and I've always mentioned that. Um, <clears throat> I've often mentioned that when I when I give a talk and. Just how I don't I don't know that it's a requirement that you know to be sober that you've got to know your sponsor sponsor and sponsor 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 and so on, but that just so happens to to be a real gift in my own in my own sobriety. You know I, I've gotten to know those guys and I've watched how they live their lives. You know I've watched the example that they that they show by what they do, and um, and that's that's been tremendous to me. There's been, there's no denying. What, what you see somebody do and the actions you see them taking, you know, I mean, that speaks volumes, you know. Um, so anyway, I, it's, I'm glad to be here, and um, I'll tell one thing I'll say, well, I'll say, yeah, Cynthia and I ended up at that Nikki Pa thing, and uh, I'd never been to anything Nikki Pa in my life. I haven't been back to anything Nikki Pa. No, no offense to anybody who goes there, you know, it was, it was just, I got sober in Boone, and that wasn't available. There was no Nikki Pa. It was just, you know, Appalachian State's there. It's just kind of a small, um, a small community of, um, of, of folks. You know, the college pretty much makes up the town. I'm sure you guys know about Boone. Um, but it was just very, the AA was small and there wasn't, I mean, you wouldn't have found a meeting this big, you know, for sure, you know, I mean, half of this would have been a really big meeting there. But anyway, that just wasn't there, you know, and, and, um, so I'd never seen anything like it, and, and Cynthia and I ended up sitting there, and somebody was getting ready to read, and they said, my name's, you know, Bob or whatever, and I'm an alcoholic, and they said, hey, Bob, we love you lots and lots and whole lots, and I was like, what's happening, you know, where am I? And I looked over at Cynthia, and, and she kind of looked the same way, and I was like, well, at least at least somebody else is a little confused here, but uh, but you know I don't I'm not judging that at all. It's not really that prevalent. Um, it's, it's it's not really that prevalent where I live now. I live in kind of a small town. I, I just actually I've done two things. I've been asking, and both times people were incredibly cordial and they invited us in there, and there was a lot of enthusiasm and um, and and it was it was interesting for sure. But uh, anyway, it was kind of funny when they were doing some of that stuff. People were shouting out during the readings. I was thinking somebody was uh, getting out of control or something, and apparently that was what they wanted them to do. I don't know, you know, it'd be like tonight if somebody was reading, somebody hollered out at you. That'd throw me off, you know. But uh, but anyway, I live um, just south of Charlotte. I, I'm, I'm from Concord, and um, I live in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Um, if anybody knows where that is, it's a little less than two hours from here, but it's pretty, I think it's due south of Charlotte, about 25 miles or so, but I, I was in Charlotte, I'm from Concord, which is north of Charlotte, and, um, uh, but I, I, you know, I've been in the area where I live now, my home group is called the Singleness of Purpose Group, it's a group that me and another guy started going on three years ago, um, when, you know, my, I, I'm married and started a family in Charlotte, but uh, my wife and I wanted to kind of move out of the city area, and um, once we moved there and had another kid, it was just difficult to get back to Charlotte to a to Southern Pacific, which was my group for ten years, which is uh, one of the, an offshoot of one of Clancy's deals, you know. 
Um, good, really good group. I, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, I got to be a member there. But anyway, started a group in the area where I live, and and it's great. You know, it's a small group. It's a small town. It's a, a, a small crowd most of the time, but we have solid meetings, and we have a nice structure. You know, that stays focused on Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we never ask if anybody's having a problem before the meeting. Um, you know, I was listening to Steve, my sponsor, sponsor, give a talk uh, on um, on, a, on a on a speaker tape or, or internet or whatever you want to call it in my car the other day, and he was talking about that. You know, those meetings where people ask if you're having a problem, and you know, he said, well, you know, everybody's got problems. If you're if you're breathing, you got problems. You know, and he said somebody will come in one of those, you know, ask that question. He said, you know. 20 alcoholic rocket scientists will take a crack at trying to solve that problem, you'll leave there more confused than when you got there, you know? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, you know, I, I don't, I, that, I'm sure some people go to meetings like that, and I, I'm probably gonna step on your toes, but um, you know, I like a meeting, I like my home group to be very focused on the solution of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't like there to be much of a question of what's going on in that group, you know? I like. I like it to be clear what we're doing there, that we're carrying the message to the still suffering alcoholic and you know, that we're talking about what we do to stay sober and hearing speakers that talk about what they've done to stay sober. So now that I've gotten all self-righteous, um, I'll uh, share my story, um, hopefully with some humility. But uh, I, um, I'm from Concord, like I say, I, I was born there in 78, I have a sister that's a couple of years younger than I am. <clears throat> um, I was born into a family with an alcoholic dad, he drank excessively from my first memories and he drank very, pretty much identically to how I ended up drinking. And um, he was a really good guy, he had a good heart, I believe that about him. He loved us kids and he, he loved my mom, I believe, but he was an alcoholic, you know, so he got drunk and did the things that alcoholics do, you know, and uh, compromised his morals and values and, um, and, and when he picked up a drink, he couldn't stop drinking, you know. And um, he died at age 30. Um, he was, we came home from visiting my grandmother and he was dead on the couch, you know. He'd uh, he'd been he he'd gotten pneumonia in his lungs and and not gone and taken care of it, and he just laid on the couch and drank booze and um, codeine uh, until he drowned on his own fluid, you know. And so watched my dad leave out of here drinking at age 30, and that was um that was pretty pertinent is pretty pertinent I think in my story. Um, you know, I'm I'm not him, and I'm not here to tell his story, but. That was certainly a very, very close glimpse of what of what alcohol and alcoholism can can end up like, and um, he uh, he had been in and out of AA. You know, I know that he didn't come in and and, and grab a hold of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the reason I know that is because no one who does that doesn't stay sober. I've never seen it happen, at least in my experience. I I shouldn't speak so absolutely, but I I've not seen somebody come into Alcoholics Anonymous and grab a hold of this thing as, as, as much as they can and not, and not stay sober. I, don't, I personally don't believe it can happen. Um, and I think my line of sponsorship agrees with that. You know, Steve actually says that a lot. He talks about, you know, at this point, I would have to, to demand to drink. You know, and, that, and that's not to be said like I'm, I'm bulletproof or anything like that. It's just to say that Alcoholics Anonymous works. If I've got all the, as he sa as Steve says, if I've got all the jets in place, I'm okay. You know, if I've got my, I've got a sponsor I'm current with, I've worked the steps, I've got a home group, I'm trying to carry the message. If all those jets are in place, I'm just fine. You know, if I stop doing that stuff, when trouble comes about, you know. Um, but anyway, so from Concord, my dad died early. We moved. We we actually lived in Charlotte when he died. We moved back to Concord and kind of just picked up life there, joined the swim club, started playing sports, and, and actually really liked Concord and kind of, you know, it was sad that my dad had passed away, but it was also way less chaotic because there was no drinking going on. Um, and uh, <clears throat> my, um, you know, we, we started making friends and, and just doing the stuff that kids do. And life went on for a few years, and when I was like, um, an adolescent, like many adolescents, I just started kind of having a, um, a, a desire to go against the culture, you know, and um, 
I don't. I think that's fairly common. You know, I think a lot of adolescents do that, and then they just end up being okay. But that's how it sort of started with me, and me and my buddies just started smashing mailboxes and smoking cigarettes and listening to uh, music that was conducive to all that. You know, I, you know, a guy like Wallace is probably a little too, you know, refined to to get this. But I, I remember listening to. Yeah, you know, I, I was like, oh, I like this Grateful Dead stuff and Led Zeppelin. That sounds uh, far out and whatnot. And then I also was like, it's funny because on the other hand, I'm like, oh, I like this Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and The Chronic and all this stuff. And, you know, those, those music, that music, all it's got in common with each other is that, you know, one of it's hip-hop sort of street rap and the other is like 70s psychedelic rock. And the only thing, you know, the thing I, I gather that I liked about both of them is that they were going in a direction that I wanted to head in, you know, <laughs> where they were rebelling against society and talking about smoking weed and this, that, and the other. And it was funny. I was thinking about, like, you know, I was just this suburban white kid, you know, listening to this hardcore rap music. You know, I had no, no grounds on which to relate to that stuff. I mean, I'd never lived in the ghetto. I didn't know anything about any. You know, I had some friends that, that you know were were you know we called an area of Concord the the bottom, and that's where everybody you know, that was African American that I was friends with lived. But anyway, it's just funny. Like I was thinking about that the other day about how I just felt so connected to this music, but I had no reason to at all. But um, but anyway, we started doing that kind of stuff, and it wasn't long before we just. Uh, got a guy with a fake ID to buy us some Milwaukee's Beast, and uh, we stashed that, that beer in the woods, and, um, and we shared enough of that. Like, I was setting out to get drunk, and I remember knowing that that could be a bad idea. Like, I, I kind of knew. I saw what happened, and I did, I'd not forgotten my dad's experience. I'd not forgotten that. But I just wanted to try it, you know? It's like, I wanted to see what this felt like, and so I drank down enough of those disgusting beers to feel the effects produced by alcohol. And, um, you know, I was with two buddies that I'm not really connected to that much today, but they're good guys, and I see what's going on in their lives by way of social media and whatnot. They've got families. They're doing just fine. They've never needed Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and what's interesting about that is on this given night, I was running around this field with my arms outstretched, you know, like I'd finally found freedom, you know, because I was drunk, you know, I was having this life-altering experience, and, uh, and these guys were just quietly sitting over by this tent sipping these beers, you know, watching me, <laughs> and, uh, and it's just interesting, the thing, you know, there's a lot of people in this world that are not alcoholics, more than, more than aren't, or that are, more that are, are not than are, and, um, you know, these guys aren't. They're just fine. They don't need AA to live their lives, and nor were they having a life-altering experience that night. They probably don't ever talk about it. I speak about it every time I talk at an AA meeting because I remember it. You know, it was that significant, and I wanted to do it as much as I could, whenever I could, wherever I could, and that wasn't all the time. And, and of course, it's alcoholism, I think, is progressive on a lot of levels, you know, in the, in the way that we drink more and more and, and go to you know, deeper sort of uh, uh, in darker spots in our actual drinking, but also just, you know, obviously the resentment and all that and the fear and everything. But I, but I just, I was like, that is, that is amazing and I want to do it all the time, you know. Like, I want to get a hold of that. And so that's what I did. And whenever I could get some alcohol, um, I did plenty of things besides alcohol and I keep my story confined to alcohol out of respect for the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you know, I, 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 and, you know, I've never had to really question which program I belong in. I know a lot of people do struggle with that, you know. Alcohol was my solution. Those other things I did, but they were not my solution. You know, drinking was my solution. And um, so I just started partying. I'll tell, I'll, I don't want to spend too much time on drinking, but I do think it's important to talk about drinking. Sometimes people come up to the podium and they say, I'm not going to talk any about drinking tonight. And I'm like, oh, God, really? You know, you should a little bit, you know, like for numerous reasons. It is Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, there's also some really good and funny stuff that comes out of that, you know? It's like, I think if I would have been brand new and somebody said, I'm not going to talk about drinking, I'd have been like, what the hell am I doing here, you know? 
Um, so anyhow, you know, I I started drinking, and and you know, it's it is a very important requirement of of being an alcoholic to have drank excessively. Um, but I, uh, <clears throat> um, oh, so I lived in Concord, and and kind of the way it was as an underage kid. I mean, I got sober at age twenty one, so. I had a relatively short stint, you know, like, and I look back on that now, and I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty short compared to a lot of people I know. Um, but at the time, like, when I came into AA, it did not feel that way. It didn't feel that way at all. I felt like alcohol ruled me. It was the only thing I knew. It was all that mattered to me. It was like if you'd asked me to go camping or something like that, so we're not going to take any alcohol, I'd have just been like, what? <laughs> you know, no thank you, you know. Um, or to a concert or anything like that. I just wouldn't have even understood why you were inviting me or why you were going and not taking alcohol. Um, but anyhow, uh, as an underage drinker for the, for the majority of my drinking and, and, and a lot of it in high school, as weird as that all is, um, you know, the, the things that we kind of did um, were we got people, uh, we either rode around in car, well, let me, let me say it like this, the best case scenario was somebody's parents went out of town and we would go over to that person's house and just completely destroy it. Um, the second best si situation as underage you know, drinkers was finding some sort of like spot in the woods or agricultural field to go set up shop and carry out our mission there. The worst, but sometimes resorted to, frequently resorted to, was riding around in cars and doing it. And none of them were very, you know, the cops seemed to find us wherever we happened to go, no matter which of those three things ended up being the choice. And I, I was always baffled by that, you know, at the time. Like, how'd they find us out here in the woods, you know? It's in freaking Concord. It's not like we're out in the Rocky Mountains or something. You know, there's probably somebody can hear us somewhere, and they're like, there's a bunch of kids causing trouble. That's what I would do. If, like somebody was, you know, I live out in the country now. If I saw some kids getting up to no good, I'd probably call the cops. I'm that lame now. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so those were the things we did. And, and I remember there, were these, there, was this one, there was this one time, or there was this one place in Mount Pleasant, North Carolina, not the, not the beautiful South Carolina Mount Pleasant. This is like sticks of North Carolina. And there was a shack somewhere in the woods and there was, a, there was a combination of a bunch of, like, people that come from the sticks. I live in the sticks now, so I can say that. But rough people from the sticks. And high school kids, you know? That is, not, that is a weird combination. Like, why is that even occurring? Why are all these hillbillies from Mount Pleasant, North Carolina, that are well out of high school, been gone, you know, <laughs> convening with all these high school kids, you know. I, I look back on that and I'm like, my God, I'm never letting my kids get out of the house when they're freaking in high school. <laughs> school and back home. But anyway, so we're at this place and this guy's manning the, the keg and his name's Bubba. And, <laughs> and I know it's, it's, it's real, I promise. It sounds made up, it's not. I crushed my keg cup, I was drunk, and I went back to ask Bubba the garter of the keg, um, if I could get another cup. And Bubba saw me, a young, goofy, drunk kid, and decided to, like, you know, make fun of me or whatever, and he demanded that I beg him for another keg cup and that I praise him, praise Bubba. I didn't think twice about it, you know? It's like I didn't even put up an argument with the guy. I was like, give me that cup now. I'll do what you want, hopefully only to a point. But... You know, <laughs> Bubba made me hail him and praise him and beg him for a cup. And, and, you know, there was a bunch of upperclassmen at this party, you know. I didn't care at all. It didn't matter. It was like, give me that cup back because I know i got to continue on what I've started here. You know, and I think alcoholics can relate to that. You know, you cannot inhibit me from what I've begun, you know. Um, so anyway... You know, life kind of went on, and I, I dated this girl in high school, and, and, and I had a lot of fun drinking, you know. It was, it was kind of a, a really, you know, I'm sure my, my perception was and continues to be off, but I felt like it was a lot of fun, you know. A lot of, I definitely started suffering consequences relatively early, getting in trouble. My mom would get called by the cops, and 
um, grades just kind of flew right out the window and um, definitely got in trouble at school. But all that was just a small price to pay for, for the drinking that I had discovered. You know, my mom had obviously seen my dad die, and, and she had been an Al-Anon, and she had educated herself on alcoholism. And she liked to talk about that. And that was my least favorite subject to discuss. <laughs> I didn't want to talk about that at all, you know? Like, please, this is the best thing I've ever found. Don't come ruining it with your AA stuff and, out and disease talk, you know? Like, no thank you, you know? Can you just keep that to yourself? But she would frequently sort of warn me and say, Tate, there's a good chance. Okay, see you later. And um, anyway, um, <clears throat> Just kind of partied a lot, and something else significant happened when I was 16, I think. I got a call to come up to the hospital. My mom was there, and I didn't know what was going on. And I got up there and went into the hospital room, and, and you know, my mom and my sister and I were incredibly close. You know, we had certainly a very dysfunctional dynamic, a lot of yelling and arguing and all that kind of stuff, but, but a tremendous amount of love, you know, like... Basically, my mom was the kind of lady that, you know, so I could talk to her, like, in a real way, you know. Um, and so I loved her a great deal. I was certainly on my way to, to kind of, um, you know, being uh, unable to express that love or deal with it the proper ways. Um, but I, w I went in there, and I asked her what was going on, and she looked at me and said, they think they found cancer. And... I like walked up to her and she started crying and I started crying and I remember that and I don't think I'll ever forget that moment in that hospital um, and it was it was a tough moment that stands out to me but something else that always that pertains to my alcoholism that I always talk about is that I was 16 years old probably just a year or two into my drinking and I don't blame anything on alcoholism I don't question why I'm an alcoholic or anything like that don't need to. There's no point in it. I certainly don't blame something like that for making me alcoholic. But what I knew about that situation is that I was not going to have to suffer that because of, my, because of what I'd found in alcohol. I knew that alcohol would carry me through that whole situation. I didn't know if she was going to live. I didn't know if she was going to die. But I knew that drinking was going to play an instrumental role in my life, I already was aware of that as a, as a, as a young kid, that drinking was going to carry me through that. And that's exactly what it did, you know. I, I drank through her illness. She had to go to uh, down sort of Duke and get treatments there at the hospital. She went through chemotherapy. She went through all sorts of just outrageously difficult procedures to try and to get her better. And I was just this selfish alcoholic kid who was zero. I mean, I cared. It's not that I didn't care. I cared greatly, but I mostly cared about how that was going to affect me, you know, how I, how, how I might be hurt by this, you know. And, um, and I loved my mom a lot, but I, I wasn't interested one iota in how I could help her in that situation. I wasn't interested in how I could assist or be, as a matter of fact, it was completely, not really intentionally, but completely the opposite. She'd go away, I'd throw a party, you know. I'd turn the house into a party central while she's having, she's being treated for cancer, you know, cancer that has spread. And, um, and you know, I, I mentioned all that. I don't beat myself up for those things today. I've, I've worked the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm absolutely not proud that I did them, but um, I know how selfish I was. I know that a program like Alcoholics Anonymous is my only chance in not being selfish the way that I'm selfish. And so I was just, you know, it talks about self-will run riot, and that's what I was doing as, a, as an alcoholic kid, you know. And uh, anyway, her, her condition got worse. I'm going to speed up. I, I moved to Colorado following this girl, um, you know, as us alcoholics sort of tend to do, get pretty obsessional and uh, and stuck on something, you know. No one else can have her. She's my girl, and so I'm gonna make sure I go across the country as a high school kid to follow her. <laughs> and uh, she wanted me to. I wasn't like stalking her or anything. But uh, <laughs> the invitation was there. But 
I left the state of North Carolina to go to Colorado in the midst of my mother's illness. Again, like, you know, I look back on that and think how, you know, my mom was supportive of it. She was, she was an amazing and sweet and just loving lady. And she wanted me to do whatever I needed to do. And, but I look back on that now and think, my God, you know, high school sweetheart that ultimately couldn't ha stand my drinking anyway. And, uh, um, and you know, leaving my mother in her illness. I just think that's, that's unbelievable uh, as far as what that speaks about how selfish I was. And so anyway, I get out to Colorado, I'm gonna hurry up here. My mom died um, like right before I was getting ready to come back to, I was coming back to see her like before she died. She was on her deathbed and it was bad. And she died that night, like literally that night before I came back and, um, and I, don't know why that happened, and I don't question it. You know, I know God, God's got a plan that's way better than Tate's, and, um, you know, I didn't deal with that either, you know. I drank to deal with that, and that was my solution. Drinking was my solution. And, um, you know, AA, of course, has given me the chance to go back and look at that and to experience sadness over that and to, you know, to feel okay with, with the fact that my mom's gone and that that tremendous loss that occurred, but um, but anyway, so she passed away, and I'm gonna hurry up here. I was out here in Colorado, or out there in Colorado, and I was just this girl finally got sick of me. She was like, I can't stand this guy anymore, and she was at CU Boulder doing well. I was a screw up, causing problems for her, and she just finally couldn't take it anymore. And, you know, I was a victim. How could she do this to me? She she really screwed me over here. And, um, you know, thank God she did that for herself. That was a very, very smart move on her part. Um, so anyway, but I'm just hanging out with some really, some really, really bad drunks and, and kind of just uh, seeking lower companionship and this, that, and the other and just just drinking to oblivion way more often than not. And uh, I'll tell this one story and then move into sobriety. I was out in Colorado, and I was with these guys, and we were drinking liquor, and we were hammered in Denver, Colorado. And we left this bar three sheets to the wind, couldn't hardly walk. Uh, five Hispanic guys were across the alleyway, and one of the people I was with yelled something. I don't know what it was, but clearly it was offensive to them. And they walked up, and I thought, oh, we're going to all, you know, talk some crap to each other. But they weren't interested in that. I don't know if it was because of the language barrier or they just didn't want to talk to us, and they just beat us up. Um, <laughs> and the cop showed up, and it was the only time I was glad to see them and welcomed them into the situation because it wasn't looking good for the drunk bunch. <laughs> and uh, they, the cop said, you guys are so drunk. And the other guys couldn't speak in any English, and they said, y'all go that way, and y'all go that way. So they sent them one way and us the other. And those guys apparently knew Denver because they circled the city block and beat us up again. <laughs> they weren't finished, I guess. And, uh, and so, anyway, one of them just hit me in the eye and gave me a nasty shiner, you know, typical black eye with the busted blood vessels or whatever. And I was going to this art school because it was the only place I could get into and I wanted to get out, follow that girl out there. Um, and I was at this school and, uh, oh no, that, that, wait, so two weeks later, it took that black eye like two weeks to heal up. And then the same guy that yelled something offensive to those Hispanic guys, we were at a party at his house and he liked this girl and he wanted, you know, to whatever, date her, date her. Um, and, <laughs> Wasn't much dating going on with any of those people, no taking out of any sorts. But uh, she was mad at me because I offended somebody horribly, and she was shoving me and shoving me and shoving me. And, 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 you know, I was drunk. I could only take so much, so I pushed her back. You know, I didn't hit her, but I pushed her. And he was defending her honor. He hit me in the same eye and made it look exactly the same way that it had. And so the point about being in this art school is that I go back there and people would just be like, what happened, you know, it's, it's, it's black again, you know. And, and I was just all scared and insecure and not comfortable in my own skin and I'd just like make up a lie about how it happened and it was just embarrassing and weird. But um, anyhow, 
I'm going to hurry up here. I moved, I ultimately landed in Boone, North Carolina, where Cynthia was talking about. And I, nothing, I was miserable is the bottom line. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about drunk stories. I was miserable and I still had a vehicle. I still had a roof over my head. You know, I, but I just couldn't hardly live with myself, you know. And that was the reality of the situation is I just could not stand to live in my own skin anymore. You know, it's like it, everything just seemed really, really dark, you know. And after sort of a typical drunk night where I blacked out and made a bunch of people mad, threw beer cans at people, I came to that next day. And I, I did not have a relationship with a power greater than myself. I talked to a power that I hoped was there and did exactly what the big book talks about. I either asked for selfish desires, I either asked God to give me things that I felt like I deserved, things like, why can't I not just drink as much as I want and life be okay? <laughs> to me, I didn't understand, like life would have been perfect if those things would have just been compatible. And I also complained a lot to a power that I had no relationship with and said things like, why, why have you done this to me? You know, why have you taken away my mom? Why have you done all, why am I an alcoholic? And, and, and complained to a God that I just didn't have any connection to at all. I don't think I could have had a connection to. So anyway, this particular day I came to and I was at my wit's end. And I believe that's what it takes for an alcoholic to get sober as we have to be out of answers. And that happened to me that day. I didn't have, I did not have an answer anymore. I did not know what I was going to do. I, I felt very convinced that I was not going to be able to figure it out. And I'm so, so grateful for that. You know, that surrender is huge, you know, like, and I was beaten into that, you know. I, and so I, I said this prayer to a God who I didn't feel, but I just asked something bigger than me. I, I said, please help me, you know. And it wasn't like help me in the way that I see fit, you know. It was just, please help me. And I called my aunt, who was in Al-Anon in Charlotte, and I told her that I thought I needed to go to AA. And, of course, she's like, oh, thank God, you know, <laughs> waiting on that. She had told me, I've been thinking about this lately. She, my sobriety date's October 17th of 99. She got married on October 8th of 99, I believe. And I was at her wedding, and obviously you're not doing that well two weeks before you get sober or whatever. <laughs> things, things aren't good. And uh, I went up to say goodbye to her, and I walked up, and I was just trying to pretend like I was okay. And I congratulated her, and, and she looked at me like with loving eyes. She looks a lot like my mom. And she said, Tate, you will be amazed at what will happen if you just do the right thing. And I wanted to tell her to shut up, you know, like, <laughs> get out of my face, lady. <laughs> Don't ever talk to me like that. <laughs> that's, that's like an alcoholic. This lady's like, like pouring love into me, and I just wanted to tell her, go to hell, you know. <laughs> and, but, you know, like things like that, you know. Thank God that lady said that to me. I don't know why. I know that had an effect. She's the one I called. I called her and I said, Gina, I think I need to go to AA. And she said, well, call them or, or call them, look it up in the phone book. They'll have a number. Give them a call. So I called the AA intergroup in Boone, which was an answering machine. And, and this guy was on there back in the days of answering machines, Charlie Faircloth. We called him Charlie Bearclaw. He was a mountain man. And he was on that recording and he was in. This is the Boone Intergroup uh, Association, and uh, we just want to let you know that Monday night there's a meeting at blah, 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 and Tuesday night there's a meeting here, 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 Wednesday night there's a meeting at this place, that place, and he reeled off every meeting in Boone in one outgoing message. <laughs> and uh, so I had to, like, call back and listen again and, like, wait for that Sunday night to come on or whatever and uh, get the address written down. And um, so that, that's that, and I went to a meeting that night, and I walked into this room where I was terrified and just felt like I was just going to come unglued any minute. And, um, but I walked into a room of alcoholics. I very much was hoping that it was a meeting similar to this and that I could sit in the far back and not have any interaction with anyone. You know, like I thought maybe I could come to AA and just sort of get it by osmosis, you know, sitting in the background. <laughs> what are they talking about? Uh, okay, that makes sense. I'll go home and do that, you know. I was clueless, you know, I had no idea that this was a program that I was going to have to jump right into, you know. I was terrified, terrified. 
And um, so I come to this meeting, and it's not like this at all. It's a circle of people, and I was the obvious newcomer in the room. <laughs> um, no one was confused about that reality. Um, and, and I sat there, and I listened to those people share, and they, um, they I, I just had no doubt. You know, it was like uh, these people seemed to, to have drunk, drank like I did, and they're talking about it, and they're all sitting here. And they're sober, and they seem like they're doing a heck of a lot better than me. I was 21. I thought my life was over. Like, I thought, I got to go to AA. This is terrible, you know? Like, I have to go to AA. That seems like an awful thing to have to do. Like, how good can that be, you know? And it's the most amazing thing that could have ever happened. But in my mind, I'm like, I'm 21 years old. I'm going to go sit with these lame people, and if I have to suffer out this lame existence with these people maybe it'll be better than what's been going on because that's been hell it's just amazing how off our perceptions are you know it's just amazing how wrong I was I thought I'll never get another girlfriend I'll never laugh really hard again maybe a giggle here and there never really like laugh hard hard I've laughed just as hard in Alcoholics Anonymous as I ever did on any you know whatever um, <laughs> harder maybe but anyway, so I'm, I, I'm, I've got so much more I want to say, I probably shut it down at what, five till, Wallace? Is that right? About five till, shut it down. All right, got a few more minutes. I, Wallace is just not even listening to me over there. <laughs> but I do want to say a few, so I found these people, and they, these people started, yeah, you know, I connected with these young guys in Alcoholics Anonymous, and Robert was one of them, and he was like, well, we go, to, or him and this other guy, Reagan, were like, well, we go to this group in Blowing Rock. You should come with us. And I was like, okay, sure. So I started going, and they were like, well, you know, we make the coffee, and then we clean up the coffee pot, or the coffee, they had mugs at this particular group. And I was just like, why, you know, why do you do that? You know, it seems so terrible and lame to do. And, uh, but they were like, yeah, this is part of what we do is service work. You know, it helps us stay sober. So they started showing me that. And then they invited me to this retreat in Jekyll Island, Georgia that a guy named Mike Way was doing the whole weekend on the steps. He's passed away now. We share a last name. He assured me it wasn't because we were related. <laughs> Somehow he knew that quicker than I could have imagined he would have known it. <laughs> but anyway, he was doing this thing and Keith Lewis did a talk on Sunday there. I was four months over and and I can't, it's hard to look back and even imagine that I would have gone on a, such a trip with these people. I didn't feel like I knew them. I felt incredibly uncomfortable. But I went. You know, I was like, I do not want to continue. I don't want to go back. I didn't want to go back to what I'd been doing. And so that was a huge motivating force to start getting, getting connected to these people and doing these things, which I believe I had to do. You know, I had to do. But... The good news was, is I, I get I, these guys are on fire, you know. Like I get down there and I hear this guy Mike Way, and he blew me away. It was one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. And then Keith Lewis spoke that Sunday, and I was like, I I just knew that something amazingly special was happening in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, you know, I'm so grateful for guys like Tom and Wallace and Keith and and these men who've who've forge the way for us, you know, I mean, that's, that's a huge deal to be in a group, you know, I don't want to give them too big of a head, but just people like that who've been doing this deal and doing it really for a long, long time, um, and it's just, it's amazing, and, and Tom, um, I, I'll share two quick things, so I just started doing, I, I'd failed out of three community colleges, and path, you can't really fail out of community colleges. They'll let you keep coming back if you pay your tuition. But I had dropped out of three community colleges and passed two classes. And that's not good track record for education. And anyway, I got sober. I got a sponsor. I start doing these things in Alcoholics Anonymous. I start hearing suit up and show up. You know, do this, do this stuff regardless of how you feel. Do it. I still, sometimes today I don't feel like doing certain things. But I know that the action is what prevails. So these guys, Robert was telling me this, and I'm just getting, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to their instruction. And, and that trickled over into my life. And I ended up going to Appalachian and, um, and getting a degree there. And, um, you know, just stuff that I could have never done on my own fruition. You know, it was all because of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Not a chance in heck I could have done it myself. So anyway, um, I went to an uh, assembly one year. I got elected GSR of the Blowing Rock Group. And Tom was there, and he was giving a workshop um, on corrections. And he, Robert wasn't even my sponsor at that time. It was this other guy. But I didn't know Tom from Adam. But I sat there, and he was doing this corrections workshop. And I was like, man, this guy's amazing. Like, he's just, like, radiating something here, you know? Like, he is, he's just, whatever he's doing, I know I want to get involved. And so I, like, went and got involved in corrections, you know, and started participating and going into the prisons. And I go to the conference every year, and I see some of you folks there. Um, That's where I saw Cynthia, and she asked me, and Wallace, and Daniel, and I'm sure others. But anyway, just... Just stuff that I would have thought like, and if you'd even told me that, you said like right when I was 21 coming in, man, Tate, you're going to go to these correctional facilities and conferences. I'd have been like, oh, God, it's getting worse by the minute. <laughs> and little did I know that kind of stuff is amazing. That stuff surpasses anything I could have ever come up with on my own, being around these spiritual folks that are just, just showing me a way to live that cannot fail, cannot fail, you know? So, you know, anyway, I'm, I've only got a few minutes. I'll, I'll tell one more Tom thing because he means a lot to me, and that's really true. I was in Wilmington when I was in early sobriety. I was in was Figure 8 Island, as a matter of fact, where my family had a, a time-shared beach place. And they were down there, and they're normal drinkers. They are. They can do it and be fine. They had an open bar out kind of like, you know. And I was happy in AA. I was glad to be sober. I did not want to drink. I didn't want to drink. But I saw this bar over there with this big bottle of doers on it, and I just couldn't, like, stop looking at it, you know? I was like, that thing's, like, haunting me, you know? It was like, like, I didn't want to drink, but, like, I just couldn't quit noticing it, you know? And I started obsessing about it, and, like, the taste of liquor. And, again, not really any desire to walk over there and start guzzling it. I'm plugged into AA. I'm doing the stuff that I'm supposed to, as far as I know. But I was like, I got to go to a freaking meeting. So I go down to this noon meeting, and I'm telling you, this probably had to be the most powerful noon meeting that's ever existed on the planet. (laughs) Tom was there, and Tom was leading this thing with Mike Way, I think. I can't remember that for sure, but I know Tom was there. But I sat through the whole meeting, and I didn't even hardly listen because I was like, I'm going to go talk to Tom about this as soon as the meeting's over. I know he'll be able to help me and give me some profound wisdom to get this obsession out of my head. So the meeting goes on. I'm not listening. I'm completely self-centered, focused on Tate. What am I going to say to Tom? How's this all going to pan out? So, you know, 18 people want to talk to him. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. I finally get up to him, and I was like, hey. And he kind of knew who I was a little bit, or at least he pretended well. And, um, and I said, Tom, I just, I, you know, and I told him this. I said, I'm just, stre- I'm just obsessing. I don't want to drink. I love AA. I love what's happening in my life. But I can't get this... Uh, liquor bottle and like this little bar setting it just keeps bothering my head and he just said huh he's like well i think the problem is and and he 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 said i think what the problem is is you're focusing entirely too much on this patient and he pointed at me (laughs) and he said you need to start focusing on some of these other patients you know and I was just like, eh, that's not what I really was looking for here, you know. <laughs> I mean, why don't you have something a little more like, I just want you to give me a mantra that will knock it out or something. But my God, what, what an amazing thing to tell an alcoholic. That's, that's exactly right. I'm sitting there thinking about myself. Stop thinking about yourself. Start asking somebody else how they're doing. See if you can be of service to another, the newcomer. See if you can, you know, share something that might help them, on, you know, get sober. So anyway, it was just a powerful thing that I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, I, you know, I'm so grateful I, I didn't get to even say a lot of what I wish I could say. I, I'll say, you know, I, I was a high school teacher for a few years and didn't care for that. Um, I ended up, uh, you know, I, I, I'm an arborist today, which is kind of a fancy word for a tree care professional. And I, I, I work in this field that I love. I climb trees on a regular basis, and, and, it's, and, and I, like, I thoroughly love it, you know, like, and that's a gift of AA, you know, like um, I met a lady in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I proposed to her that same weekend that Cynthia and I were at the Nikki Paw thing. And uh, I did that on, you know, on a mountaintop. And we, we, had, you know, we had a reasonable relationship. You know, we, we, we dated and we got to know each other and we, we got married. And, um, 
and uh, we've got two kids and one on the way. Uh, boy, that will wear you out. And, um, and, but, it, but it's amazing. I love my little kids so much. And, and I say all that, and I'll shut up with this. I'm well aware that you do not have to be sober to produce children. I know there's many people in this room that probably are aware of that same fact, you know. <laughs> Sobriety is not a requirement for having kids, you know. Um, I don't think I'd be here if it was. Um, but, you know, there's no big, you know, there's six billion people or whatever, seven billion people. There's no big deal about the fact that I have a couple of kids and one on the way. It's a big deal to me, of course, and a wife that I love. We fight, we do, but we're best friends. She's my best friend. She's... She's a fellow member of AA. And, and all that stuff's not really miraculous, you know. It is it's, 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 it's for me, and the reason that it is is not because those things are a reality, but because I'm sober, you know. Like, I get to be a good dad to those kids. I get to participate in their lives. I get to try and be a good husband um, and, you know, and be of service to my wife and, and do things that are just a far cry from the way I operate, you know, just a far cry from how I would do it. So anyway, Alcoholics Anonymous, without a shadow of a doubt, is, is the best thing that ever happened to me. I thought it was sort of a lame sentence to boredom, um, but as the book says, we're not a glum lot. I've done anything I could have hoped to and much more sober, um, and I, I love it, and I appreciate you guys having me. Sorry if I went a little long. Thank you. <laughs>